Hello, can you hear me? So firstly, I would like to thank all of you for coming from far away to this nice place, and uh, Antonio and Augusto for uh, hosting this uh, very nice conference. Uh, my version of the story is uh, traditional unconventional superconductor and how both Einstein BCS crossover concept can be correlated with that. I will talk about local phase coherence, pair formation, and magnetic resonance mode. Okay, so let's start with just simple BCS theory. This is a figure of BCS theory. So in BCS theory, TC is determined by the uh, energy gap, and the gap size is determined by the uh, Debye frequency and so on. So uh, TC scales with Debye frequency. However, TC does not depend on carrier population to the zero soda approximation. And this can be understood very easily. There is, you know, this is a black gap here, but you can probably artificially make this thing to be a red gap. And uh, in that case, the gap side becomes half. And so uh, your TC becomes half. But the, uh, all the, super, all the con carriers in this Fermi sphere condenses and becomes superfluid. And in that sense, the uh, carrier density or the superfluid density is not depending on TC in BCS superconductor. Okay. So, in the beginning of the uh, high TC cuprate era, we started to measure the magnetic field penetration depths or the superfluid density. And here we plot TC versus the uh, superfluid density of various cuprate systems. And what we found is that uh, TC increases in the underdoped region with increasing doping, but there is seemingly very strong and clear correlation between TC and the carrier density or superfluid density NS over M star. So in my opinion, this was the first, one of the first indications that the condensation of these cuprates could be fundamentally different from BCS condensation. Okay, not only this uh, carrier density dependence, but uh, from this penetration depth, which is measuring NS over M star, if we know M star, we can calculate how many carriers are there, and then make this diagram of uh, how they are overlapping in the coherence region. And uh, as you can see, most of these uh, cuprate superconductors have several carriers overlapping in the coherence region, but this is very different from BCS situation where many, many thousands of carriers are overlapping. And uh, this is close to the other limit of Bose-Einstein condensation of superfluid herring, for example, each boson is barely touching with each other. So this is in between these two situations, but uh, uh, very impressively close to the Bose-Einstein condensation situation. Now, uh, we continued, of course, to measure various different unconventional superconductors. For example, carbon-60 system comes on the almost same slope, and uh, we also found that uh, uh, ion arsenide systems, many of them come on this same plot. And so this means that uh, these things are more three-dimensional than cuprates. And so even for three-dimensional systems, this universal relationship between TC and the superfluid density seemingly hold. And so there seems to be, I mean, again, coming from something fundamental. Now, uh, also with the accumulation of data, there are some systems which doesn't come on this particular slope, but uh, all still quite carrier density and their TC are more or less linearly correlated. They are electron doped superconductors which come on this slope, as well as, for example, lithium ion arsenide and uh, ion serenide. Most recently, uh, some of you came probably to the yesterday afternoon session. We discovered this is a work of Zurab Guccia in our group, uh, we discovered that uh, morin telluride and uh, niobium diserenides, this transition metal dichalcogenide, their TC and the superfluid density is again linearly related, but the slope is about 16 times different from that of all doped cuprates. And so uh, this uh, linear relationship seemingly occurring not only in the very Bose-Einstein limit, but uh, uh, also in some other places as well, and I will try to interpret how this can happen. Okay, so uh, the superfluid density can be put into the energy scale. If you remember that two-dimensional Fermi energy is just correlated to two-dimensional carrier density divided by the mass. So I changed this uh, 
horizontal axis of the plot into effective Fermi energy or kinetic energy of superconducting carriers. For three-dimensional systems, we can also estimate that and made this plot in 1991. And uh, you see that BCS superconductors, their Fermi energy is very high, carrier density is very high, but TC is low. There is no correlation between these two parameters. But uh, new superconductors like ion acidizers, cuprates, and many of these unconventional superconductors have very high TC. Uh, with respect to Fermi energy or charge energy scale or Drew day energy scale. Now, then we can think about uh, what would be the hypothetical Bose condensation temperature if we give the given number of charge carriers fermions, two of them each would make tightly bound bosons and make a non-interacting ideal Bose gas. And uh, this TB line shows this uh, idealized Bose condensation temperature. As compared to that, the Real TC of these materials, cuprates and so on, about factor of four or five reduced. But still, this linear relationship is similar or parallel to this ideal Bose gas situation. And so this is suggestive of important sort of uh, conceptual con content of this Bose condensation. We can plot the superfluid helium for it's here. Uh, it's close to TB line, but it's about 50% lower. I will come to that soon. And uh, the uh, cold atoms, if you multiply 10 to the 8th of both axes, could be very close to this TB line when they do Bose Einstein BCS crossover. So, this is an experimentalist way, my way of uh, classifying various different superconductors in the limit of Bose Einstein to BCS condensation. Okay, so this uh, new plot, I'm very happy that new point was added by Pablo, and uh, it's here, as you can see here. And uh, not only this absolute value being very similar or very high in, in this uh, you know, ratio, but also he tuned uh, this carrier density by gating, and uh, there is a small change, but essentially the ratio of TC over TF is uh, not quite much changed. So that means that uh, there is a, anyway, so this, this uh, graphene point is not only one point, but there are many, many points which is parallel to this line. Okay. So, uh, then we think about uh, some conceptual concept of B Bose Einstein to BCS crossover. We started to think about that uh, around 1994. And uh, if, you, <laughs> if you identify that pair formation, Ryan is probably similar to the uh, uh, T star uh, pseudo gap uh, temperature. And then uh, you can think about increasing carrier density and the uh, low carrier side is uh, maybe be having uh, paired bosons bo in the normal state. And it's like Bose Einstein, right? But uh, in the high NTC is related to the carrier density, but high density side as BCS superconductors, normal state is fermions. And uh, this crossover may be taking place also related to the retardation. This is the comparison of energy scale of carrier and the energy scale mediating uh, the bifrequency like interaction. And uh, I will come back to this point if I have a time later. Okay, so uh, in this diagram, you can see that there seems to be natural upper limit of actual TC of all these existing superconductors, and this is about factor of four or something re reduced from TB. And uh, I would like to resort to analogy with superfluid helium on how we can uh, consider this could happen. So this is a phase diagram of various unconventional superconductors and superfluid helium. You have parent or competing state, antiferromagnetic state or hexagonal closed pack solid helium state. And uh, you have also a uh, superfluid state or superconducting state. The uh, boundary is first order transition, so they are seemingly very sort of analogous, in my opinion. And so let's think about what happens in superfluid helium, which is the actual limit of Bose condensation, Bose Einstein like situation. So the, there is an important excitation called rotons in superfluid helium. This is the uh, dispersion relation of pro <laughs> roton phonon excitation. And uh, in my opinion, this ex roton gives a low energy excitable level, level, and that is determining that uh, the real lambda point is 2.2 Kelvin, 
the uh, idea is just, just calculated Bose-Einstein condensation temperature from the mass and density is 3.2 Kelvin. So why uh, the uh, lambda point is lower than the uh, ideal Bose gas? And uh, in my opinion, that can be explained by the existence of this uh, roton excitable mode. So roton is a soft phonon mode of the uh, solidification of helium. If you, know, if you solidify, this comes to zero energy. So this is a temporal fluctuation of uh, uh, hexagonal-like configuration of atoms, and uh, uh, that can deplete actually the, the uh, condensate. So the best way to convince you is just to plot T lambda versus roton energy, and uh, the highest temperature, 2.2 Kelvin point, is the ambient pressure. If you apply pressure, the both energy scales go down linearly, but uh, very soon, with some pressure, the helium solidifies. So you can follow only this part. But uh, this is a very interesting result that TC of the bosonic superfluid helium is determined uh, very related to the soft mode energy towards related to the competing state. So hexagonal closed pack correlations are uh, saying something to the uh, TC of the superfluid helium. So then we would like to see something similar in the case of convention, unconventional superconductors. This is the, my <laughs> candidate for roton like thing is the resonance mode in super, uh, in cuprate. This is a plot of resonance mode energy versus TC. And uh, of course, uh, these cuprates have much higher energy. So we multiplied both axes, the vertical and horizontal axis, by factor 60 to the, uh, compare with Roton. Uh, if you have the same slope, that means that energy relation is the same as Roton. As you can see, the, uh, already that the slope is very close to the slope of Rotons. And, uh, then you can remember that uh, this magnetic resonance mode has an hourglass-like shape dispersion. And fat matter thermodynamically, I think, is the lowest en energy excitable mode. And so that is called spin gap. And if you plot the spin gap energy of the cuprates, the ratio of mode energy and TC is almost identical to that of the uh, rotons. OK. So this comparison can be made not only in cuprates, but in various different materials. This is a product of TC versus mode energy in uh, cuprates and ion arsenide system, heavy pheromon, xerium kappa 2, silicon 2, and uh, helium rotons. They are very similar in ratio, you know, almost one unique ratio. And you can also see that uh, in momentum space, rotons are sort of uh, soft mode of the uh, hexagonal growth pack competing uh, solid state and uh, the uh, magnetic resonance mode is essentially the dynamic fluctuation of the uh, uh, anti-thermatic order spin density wave state. So uh, you can also, we can also enjoy that uh, this is how this, uh, if you have this energy uh, landscape of free energy like this, then a superconducting state is achieved. But the TC of the superconducting state may be related to the competing state's free energy. And uh, if they are very close, then the TC becomes low. So this resonance mode roton is just uh, excitation from this uh, one branch to the other branch. And uh, that thermodynamically determines TC of both like system. And uh, um, you see, and uh, <laughs> OK. So, Let's see if an actual uh, phase diagram can be related to this. So this is a cuprate phase diagram. And in my opinion, as I mentioned, T star is uh, correlated with a pair formation from T star pair formation starts. So you have more and more bosons uh, with lowering temperature. And uh, uh, actual, so at some point, there, this uh, uh, temperature, at high temperature, the bosons have this uh, thermal wavelengths, which is very short, and so they are independent from each other. But if you lower temperature, you will get at some point the point where the local phase coherence, so each of the wave function of bosons, are sort of nearby bosons are starting to, to uh, overlap. Uh, and this situation is only local phase coherence, and TB represents under the upside at risk in this situation. Uh, but actual TC happens about factor of four lower temperature. And so uh, uh, there, and that, in my opinion, is due to this competition between superconducting state and competing antiferromagnetic order and uh, rotons. And uh, so resonance mode is a key factor which determines thermodynamically. In fact, 
if you see, many people just think that superconductors thermodynamic uh, temperature scale is only the pair breaking of a across the energy gap. And uh, that is only true when your final state is single E. If your final state is 2E, you have to find out some excitation which is pair non-breaking. And uh, in my opinion, resonance mode is a very good candidate, like rotons, for that pair non-breaking excitation. OK, so uh, let's see if there's a signature of this local phase coherence build up. And uh, in my opinion, this Nernst effect and diamagnetism uh, measured by Ong and the co-workers is one of the candidates. And uh, you see that uh, uh, the uh, onset of Nernst temperature is very high, like a factor of four higher than actual TC. In the, uh, if you approach to the optimal doping, this T star becomes uh, lower. So that means bosons are not as abundant as the underdoped side, and so your uh, local phase coherence temperature is also reduced. Okay. Uh, another possible indication comes from recent photo-excited transient optical responses measured by Andrea Cavallari's group. What I'm showing here is just equilibrium optical conductivity of potassium 360, and uh, uh, the red line is normal state, and the uh, superconducting state will have this missing Drude component shown by the uh, blue line. But interestingly, uh, if they excite the system with uh, a laser and uh, some phonons, and then uh, the system shows this uh, superconducting-like response, optical conductivity, even at, for example, 100 Kelvin. This looks like very much like the uh, equilibrium 10 Kelvin response. And uh, so this response goes up to about 200 Kelvin. And uh, this is only transient. But uh, this energy scale is, again, about factor of four, something higher than the actual TC. And so uh, it is a good candidate for this phenomena. So uh, <laughs> this uh, uh, higher energy scale of local phase coherence. And uh, uh, this is the plot of LSCO and YBCO. Uh, you can see that the, the pink line is a, a hypothetical Bose condensation line. And the local phase coherence line at the uh, lower doping and that is overlapping with the Nernst onset temperature and uh, diamagnetism onset temperature. So this uh, circular sign in the middle graph, YBCO, that represents the onset uh, temperature of Cavallari's optical conductivity. And the superfluid density is coming from the, the transient superfluid density. So both of this transient point existing, but uh, very close to this uh, idealized Bose condensation, right? And that is a... Uh, Again, this uh, local phase coherence. So this seems, these two f experiments seem to be uh, representing the point energy scale of local phase coherence build up. OK, and uh, in organic superconductors, Nernst effect was also measured. And in the underdoped, there's not much of underdoped side, but in the underdoped side, actually, the uh, energy scale estimated from superfluid density and uh, this Bose hypothetical Bose-Einstein condensation temperature is comparable to the onset temperature of the Nernst effect. In the carbon 3C60, as I mentioned, the uh, Cavallari's experiment was performed on potassium 3C60, and this is the phase diagram. The uh, local phase coherence energy scale is shown by this blue star, and uh, the uh, onset temperature of their uh, transient superconductivity is comparable to that temperature scale. So, uh, in addition to this uh, uh, TC versus TF plot, uh, which used to be representing only equilibrium in the static situation, we now have points from optical conduct, you know, the uh, Cabarelli experiment and Nernst experiment, uh, which is uh, shown here for four different systems. And in the underdoped region, at least their temperature scale is comparable to this uh, idealized Bose-Einstein condensation temperature scale. And uh, I just want to say that uh, there's one point from uranium ruthenium to silicon-2. If you assume, and actually in this system, Nernst effect starts from the uh, hidden order temperature, and uh, that hidden order temperature is actually overlapping with this Bose-Einstein condensation hypothetical local phase coherence line. Okay. Uh, by spending some uh, remaining time, I would like to talk about pairing mechanism. And uh, I've been showing this something called the Uemura plot, which is the plotting of TC versus Fermi energy or charge energy scale. 
There's another plot made by Moria and Ueda plotting TC versus spin fluctuation energy scale. And uh, so the lovers of BCS theory would always say that look at this and uh, TC is correlated to the uh, device like frequency if you assume that the uh, spin fluctuation is the uh, pair magic. But you see that these two plots look very much alike. And the real reason that these plots look alike is that, uh, please look at the right hand side, if you plot actual J and uh, Fermi energy obtained from superfluid density of many of these superconductors, they are almost identical. So J of the cuprates are about 2000 Kelvin and that is about the energy scale of this uh, uh, penetration depth superfluid density. And uh, so this means that uh, these systems are just, and there are many in the uh, optimal adopt region, and uh, in there, so they are sort of Fermi energy is comparable to H by omega B. And so this means that uh, the uh, maximum of this Bose Einstein BCS condensation or optimal doped region is actually happening when uh, uh, retarded interaction and non retarded interaction is separated. And uh, okay. So, but this means that uh, there seems to be microscopically some important uh, indication. Uh, in the static limit, you always are shown that uh, if the charge carriers are hopping, that would make frustration. But if your spin system, if your environment is fluctuating with this, uh, about the same time scale of that charge carrier motion, then you can avoid this frustration dynamically. Okay. So this uh, anti ferromagnetic energy, spin fluctuation energy scale, if that is uh, comparable to the the charge energy scale, you can avoid this frustration. And uh, that would, of course, save kinetic energy because carriers can move. And uh, I call this traffic light resonance because uh, this is just like New York City, uh, where the traffic light is uh, uh, with, <laughs> with sequenced with the motion of the car, and traffic light uh, is like spin uh, selection rule, how about you, spin fluctuations. And the motion of the car is motion of the charge. And then uh, you don't have to stop this traffic light for like more than 10 uh, avenues. But uh, in fact, in real cuprates, probably you have to go only three or four lattice constants. And, uh, but this mechanism, of course, uh, can occur only when your charge energy scale J and uh, uh, no, charge energy scale TF and J is comparable. So this is a something newer concept of uh, pairing. Uh, essentially, the, in, in any system, it has like this spin fluctuations or charge fluctuations or something. This, the system has its own dynamic energy scale. And uh, if the, uh, your charge motion energy scale can have some resonant behavior, then uh, you will be able to, to reduce kinetic energy, and uh, this is very hypothetical proposal from me, maybe about 10 years, since 10 years ago. Of course, uh, if static order happens, there's no traffic light change, and so you cannot have superconductivity. Okay, uh, finally, I would like to tell you a little bit about first uh, low dimensional system. This is superfluid helium film that is uh, plotted, the superfluid density plotted versus TC and temperature, and uh, you are seeing that uh, that helium on, on Mylar, or even helium on Bicor, which it is a rather random system, or even mixture of superfluid uh, bosonic helium-4 and ferminic helium-3, these systems, this T TC follows the universal relation of uh, cost surface transition. The reason that you see this uh, uh, flat temperature dependence in this system is that the roton is existing in two-dimensional helium, but its energy scale is much, much higher. Okay, now, so uh, there is seemingly interesting relationship between TC and T, <laughs> two-dimensional TF in this system following this Kosteritz-Saurus behavior. Now, so uh, if you plot this Kosteritz-Saurus line in the, uh, my plot, then you will find that the uh, um, new system uh, of Pablo, this graphene system, and single layer ion serenade system also comes very close to this limit. 
However, they are here because, not because simply they are the firm. If you have BCS-like firm, probably you will have start from much higher superfluid density, and then uh, jump may be there because the cost of service is universal, but uh, you will see a very different situation. And so in that sense, I think that the Pavlov system is very close to actually strongly correlated or Bose-Einstein-like system. So the, my final message is that I show that Bose-Einstein BCS crossover in the uh, existence of competing state may be very important. And uh, charge density waves may be a very important competition with, in the case of transition metal dichalcogenide. I show that in elastic resonant mode, this is a pair breaking excitation. This is maybe a new kind of phase fluctuation you can think about for condensed bosons. And uh, I finally show resonant spin charge motion. This is a hypothetical proposal of my pairing mechanism. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>